Hello and welcome back to part 3 of the Tank Encyclopedia's Mouse series. I am once again, Kona Vark, and I hope that you enjoy. With all work on mouse development over by the end of 1943, all that was left of the program was a contract for a pair of hulls and for a single turret. The completed hull, now at Bublingen for trials, was not going to be wasted despite the serial production being cancelled. A program for these trials was set on 1st November 1943, but without a turret, a weighted mock-up would have to be used to simulate the loading on the hull. This mock-up turret was a crude affair, roughly similar in shape and size to the mouse term, but unable to rotate and held in place by cross pieces which were simply tightened up against the underside of the 2959mm diameter opening in the hull for the turret ring to hold it in place. Trials started extremely well on 15th January with a 2km off-road trip showing the extreme ease and accuracy of steering. During travel off-road on soft clay soil, despite its enormous bulk, the mouse only sank 50 centimeters into the ground, yet still managed to steer and drove through it successfully. Work at Bublingen to finish the interior took place in the second half of January 1944. After that, it undertook its first successful trial and was then back on trial on 31st January. Here, during this test, the first problem was found. The rubber rings within the wheels, something which had already been identified as a weak point, started to fail under the load after just a 14 km journey, of which the 9.4 km on a hard surface were likely responsible. New and improved road wheels were already on order despite the existing orders for no further development on the mouse to take place. Here though, Porsche may have been a little bit disingenuous with the high command, as whilst the mouse was now effectively dead, he was calling the vehicle by his original designation of Type 205 once more. The driving system from Porsche had been proven effective with the ease of steering and this was reinforced on 3rd February when the turning of this massive vehicle was tested. It could turn both within its own length by reversing one track and driving the other forwards, or in a minimum radius of 14.5 meters for a full 360 degree turn when driving forward on just one track. Dr. Porsche must have been very proud of his design work, as it had proven itself to work very well and the final work on the hull, such as welding on towing eyes, was completed during February 1944 with a two-day off-road trip trial personally conducted by Dr. Porsche on 8th and 9th February 1944. During this time, the otherwise grey-coloured mouse hull and Erzeskovic turret were painted with a rough three-tone camouflage scheme consisting of a base coat of Dunkelkelb RAL7028, over which green and red-brown stripes were painted, along with a small backwards Soviet hammer and sickle motif on the side of the hull, possibly to confuse any observers about the origins of this machine. It was painted in this way that Type 205-1 became stuck in very soft, swampy ground on the testing ground. That area of the ground was avoided by all tanks, but the driver, not knowing his way around, stumbled into it and the hull sank to about half its height in the soft mud. Extricating this enormous tank was easier than might be imagined, as it required only for the mud at the back to be dug out and some timbers placed under the tracks for it to free itself under its own power. Despite this, the photos of the mouse stuck in the mud and subsequently being cleaned appear regularly in books and online as evidence as to why the mouse was a failure, as it would sink in the ground. Tests on and improvements to the turret were carried out throughout July 1944, and the finish machine was an imposing sight. It should be noted at this point that there were both external and internal differences between the two mouse holes at Bublingen. Hull 1 had three shell deflectors on the roof of the hull to help eliminate the shot trap which Porsche had previously complained about. Hull 2 only had a single wide deflector on the hull. The second difference is the engine. Both vehicles had originally been fitted with a Daimler-Benz MB507 engine, but in February 1944, hull number 1 was refitted with the Daimler-Benz MB509 motor. The tests were, on the whole, highly successful. The mouse could be driven easily and with a fine degree of control. Ground pressure and traction were acceptable, and the drive system, in contrast to many other German heavy vehicles like the Tiger II and Jagdtiger, was more than sufficient for the job, especially after the improved engine had been fitted. There had been problems, the sort of things expected in trials, requiring changes to a few features such as periscopes to improve visibility, the driver's seat, ammunition stowage, the traversing mechanism, and those original wheels which had failed. 
The engine had also not worked as well as was wanted and was suffering valve damage, although it is not clear if this was a manufacturing problem or as a result of stress in the engine during testing. On top of this, the original 1100mm wide flat plate track had proven unsuitable and was replaced with a new track plate with removable ice cleats which were produced by Skoda. On the whole, there was nothing out of the ordinary for testing and the vehicle was able to move and maneuver adequately under its own power, yet despite this, on 19th August 1944, all work on the Type 205 was stopped and Krupp workers were diverted to more urgent work. Despite this order, some work continued to be done on the mouse, including on the new engine, which had proven to be problematic. On 1st December that year, Daimler-Benz had acknowledged that a new engine for the tank, the MB-517, was nearly ready. It had been ordered by OKH, but then cancelled and left unfinished. Two weeks' work would see it operational, but Daimler-Benz was reticent about giving the engine away. Obtaining the MB-517 engine for the mouse would at least mean that both tanks had the same engine. Both vehicles, Hull 1 with the E-Term, and Hull 2 with Turret 1, were taken from Bublingen and sent to Kummersdorf in the second half of 1944. Here, at the end of the war, Vehicle 2 with Turret 1 was blown up. When Soviet forces captured Kummersdorf and the blown up mouse hull, as well as the complete but E-turreted second vehicle were found, they conducted some firing trials on the second vehicle. At least seven hits were obtained on the side of the second vehicle, including two on the side of the E-term, some or all of which were using shape charge ammunition. The front of the hull was also subject to being fired at with at least 10 hits to the glacis, lower front, and track guards respectively. After these seemingly impromptu trials, the Soviets recovered the turret from the wrecked vehicle and installed it on the first hull, and shipped it back to the Soviet Union for further examination. There, it eventually had all of the interior stripped out, and the engine, motors, and transmission were all removed, leaving an empty armored shell. The vehicle, thankfully, survives to this day and is on display at the Patriot Park Museum at Kubinka near Moscow. A final element in the story of the mouse is a report dated 13th of March 1944, four months after serial production had been cancelled by Dr. Muller of Krupp, stating that production of the mouse holes and turrets could be restarted if required. Five days later, on the 18th, Krupp reported that seven mouse holes had been finished by the armor workshops and that it had enough armor plate on hand to finish another eight hulls. On top of this, the order to send unused armor to the Sturmgeschütz program back in October 1943, immediately prior to the mouse program being cancelled, seems to have been interpreted fairly liberally, as there was clearly a lot of armor plate still available. There was enough, in fact, for about another 30 hulls and turrets, as well as 15 more hulls and 9 turrets worth of cut plate. Those 30 hulls and turrets worth of armor should have been sent away to the Sturmgeschütz program, but having retained them at Krupp for whatever reason, in spite of no orders for them, Krupp now had enough material to fabricate 45 mouse hulls and 39 turrets from that material, plus the 7 finished hulls and armor prepared for 8 more, a total of 60 or so hulls and 39 turrets. On 23rd March 1944, despite the program having been cancelled, Pfaffenprüfungsam 6 was under orders from Hitler to accelerate testing and to resume development of the mouse. Porsche contacted Krupp around this time to request not only delivery of the second turret for the existing mouse holes, but also for a follow-on design of a turret known as Mouse 2. On 1st April 1944, when looking at restarting mouse production, it was determined that an additional 200 workers would need to be allocated, and that even then the rate would be just one or two tanks per month. This would be restarting production from Vehicle 8 onwards as, by this time, two hulls had been finished and shipped out, leaving six partially completed hulls awaiting scrapping. Approval to scrap hulls 3 to 6 was given on 27th July 1944. There were to be no more mouse completed, two had been built and were going to be tested. The leftover pieces, though, were not scrapped. A British report from 1945 shows that three mouse hulls and turrets were found at Meppen, with the hulls on their sides and turrets upside down. The examination shows the highest number found to be number 6. A complete 12.8cm KWK-44 monoblock gun with coaxially mounted 7.5cm KWK-44 monoblock gun was found on the same range a few miles away. The British examination of records at the range showed that this 12.8cm KWK-44 had been rechristened 12.8cm KWK-82, 
and that ammunition had been delivered in November 1943, and that ammunition was there by at least 3rd January 1944. This was a brief idea from May 1944 to consider how and if a 15cm or 17.4cm gun could be mounted on the chassis of a mouse to compete with the same idea based on the E100 hull. Less than a month after being floated as an idea, it was discounted in favor of considering the E100 hull project instead. No Sturmgeschutz was ever built and no drawings are known to survive. One of the more unlikely offshoots of mouse development was the consideration in late September, early October 1943 to use series production mouse turrets as static defensive structures. The situation had been forced upon Speer by a lack of steel casting capacity for the 12.8cm and 15cm Panzer term, and, as the mouse was designed to be able to mount a 15cm gun, these turrets might be a solution to the fortress turret shortage. The result was that Krupp was asked to prepare a design for such an installation and duly on 2nd November 1943 it did just that, providing a drawing of a mouse turret for use on a bunker. With the cancellation of the mouse turret production just three days later on the 5th, the idea became impossible and was abandoned, although quite how realistic the idea was anyway is debatable. John Milson, writing in 1973 about the mouse, questioned just how much the men responsible for the design of vehicles like the mouse really believed in the value of such a machine as a weapon of war. He doubted that they really believed in these projects and, while certainly they may have denounced them post-war as ludicrous and wasteful, their actions during the war belie this. Porsche, in particular, was pressing hard for the mouse project right from the start, and even after it was cancelled, in order to restart it. Hardly the actions of a man who felt it was pointless. It was clearly felt by many in the industry that manufacturing a technical solution was possible to ensure dominance over the increasingly better armored, better armed enemy tanks that were being encountered in superior numbers. Dr. Porsche also no doubt reveled in the engineering of a vehicle he had designed and made full use of his political connections to gain and maintain support for the mouse long after its perceived utility was over. As a piece of engineering, the mouse is impressive in the challenges it created and the solutions presented. However, the size, armor, and firepower were simply an extravagance Germany did not need and could ill afford in terms of time, money, and material. There is no realistic consideration that the mouse, even if produced in number, could have made any substantial effect in the campaign or the war. It is far more likely that the ignominious fate which awaited the single finished vehicle would have been shared by any others that were built, namely being abandoned when it ran out of fuel or broke down and then blown up by its own crews, a fate that befell many other German heavy tanks. Yet the mouse is still around, preserved at Kubinka and marking the top end of what a tank could really be in terms of armor and firepower during the Second World War. Thank you all so much for watching this three-part series on the mouse on the Tank Encyclopedia's YouTube channel. I've been Kona Vark. Please be sure to leave a like, comment down below on how I did, and be sure to subscribe to the Tank Encyclopedia's YouTube channel for more videos like this. That's all for this video. Make sure to follow our website, we'll be releasing new articles on the regular. You can follow us on Facebook, Twitter, Instagram or Reddit and if you use Discord there's a link to our community server in the description. Also likes, comments and subscriptions on YouTube are greatly appreciated. If you would like to help us continue to develop and expand also consider donating on Patreon or PayPal. All of the funds will be used to help us enhance and design new articles and features for you. Until next time, keep us in your sights.